Hey folks, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, on the viewer front, we have the MFA viewer in release. Um, be interested to catch up with you guys in a minute about where that work is on the other viewer side. Um, let's see, our, hopefully our next promotion is going to be performance improvements. Uh, we just pushed out an RC update for that yesterday, um, trying to see if we've got the crash rate down to an acceptable level. I um, think we've got all the outstanding bugs uh, sorted out at this point. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, a lot of interesting work going on with materials project. I'll let the folks working on that comment in a minute. Um, and talking with uh, Beck about trying to get our respective um, performance floater uh, frame rate management schemes reconciled, which is going to be a little bit of, a, of an undertaking, I think. Um, let's see, other topics, uh, yeah, I guess first topic is MFA. What, where, where does that stand with Firestorm and with other viewers? Oh, hey, nice. Congrats, Kitty. Thanks, Beck. Yeah, uh, everything talking to uh, Jess when we shipped it, it sounded like she was going to be able to pull it into their beta, so that's great to hear. One of the big questions with MFA is at what point we want to start, um, you know, requiring people who have opted into MFA to use an MFA compatible viewer. Um, currently, you know, the, the MFA viewer will enforce your decision to use MFA, but you can still get on with some other viewer that doesn't. Um, of course, it, you know, to really secure your account, you want to be enforcing that consistently across all viewers. So we want to do that, but we don't want to do that uh, you know, before people have the option of running an MFA compatible viewer on their, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of platform of choice. Um, thoughts on that? Is it reasonable to do that once, you know, kind of most of the viewers have an MFA out? Do we want to wait until kind of all of the officially supported ones are out, um, are, are, are out with MFA? Um, don't want to have this drag on too long, but I, I want to understand the timing of, uh, you know, folks and other, uh, working on other viewers. So, um, I guess for, for informational purposes, um, if we turn this on, <clears throat> uh, users who have opted into MFA will uh, but are using a non-MFA capable viewer, we'll start getting an error message prompting them to upgrade to an MFA capable viewer or to disable MFA on, you know, secondlife.com. So, so um, I don't think we need to wait until all sort of non-MFA viewers are, are out of support as long as there is an available upgrade path for them to follow the instructions in that error, method, error message. Um, it seems like a sort of reasonable compromise mm -hmm. uh, to me. Um, that's what the error message is, is going to say, um, and, and hopefully it'll make sense to, to the users that encounter it, and they will have something constructive they can do with it. Yes, that's the intent. Is it would uh, it would it would pop up directly in the flow, and that's what we've tested uh, internally. Um, yeah, it would it would it's not it's it's a specific error message for handling that case. It's not a generic contact support thing. 
Okay, well, we'll we'll keep everybody in the loop on our thinking with that, um, you know. But uh, obviously, we want to wait until the main viewers have uh, have a supporting version out at least. Uh, one other question I had uh, is much more obscure, but I'm trying to clear up an old Jira that's still hanging around. We were changing a URL that's used during login. Um, and currently, this thing is turned into a redirect. Um, I think any reasonably current viewer is not using this link anymore. But I just wanted to uh, just wanted to make sure that that was the case before I told the web team that it was okay to to pull the plug on that uh, URL. So if anybody knows that they do or don't depend on that currently during login, um, just let me know. Okay, that's good to know, Beck. Yeah, I kind of think we talked about this before, but it's the Jira's still hanging around, and I don't think it ever got resolved, so just thought I'd toss it out there. Um, let's see, other business. I've uh, been tweaking the schedule a bit, um, so keep an eye on the uh, for for this meeting. Keep an eye on the uh, public calendar as the best source of authority on when we're going to be meeting. I think we've currently got it set for every four weeks, so we'll uh, see how we do with that. Um, but uh, take a look before you uh, you know, come to the next one. Uh, other than that, uh, I wanted to give the graphics team a chance to talk about the materials work a bit. Um, I think that's uh, we, you know, which is going to include PBR support and some other cool features. Um, so I think I think folks will be interested in that once it's uh, you know far enough along that we can start putting out a uh, project viewer for it. Um, Dave, do you want to give a kind of a capsule summary of what we're shooting for there? Sure. Uh, so it, the goal is to introduce uh, material uh, assets, um, which would uh, enter the render pipe similar to how mesh assets do, um, where um, Objects come in with a material asset uh, associated with an object face, uh, and then the viewer fetches that asset and applies it to the face, which obviously brings up lots of um, third-party viewer concerns around things like, um, well, like when we when we introduced mesh support, it was a while before third-party viewers uh, adopted the uh, the mesh capability. Um, so what do we display if the viewer doesn't uh, provide that capability? And the thinking right now is uh, that artists will build content that has a texture entry that um, is a suitable fallback for if the material asset is missing or if the viewer has decided to not apply the material asset. Um, for example, if uh, if someone's computer isn't powerful enough to do uh, PBR rendering, then they'd want to fall back to whatever's in the texture entry and use the, the legacy render pipe. So uh, third-party viewers that haven't adopted the feature yet would get that behavior. Uh, and also along with that comes uh, uh, reflection probes, because PBR doesn't look like PBR unless you've got environment maps that look like the environment. Um, and that work has been going on for a couple of weeks now with lots of discussion in the content features Discord channel. Um, I think that about covers it. Uh, Euclid, did you want to say anything or tell me? Uh, no, I think you covered everything. The we do, you know, just as we work along here, we're coming up with as many questions as answers, and I think we're still thrashing out a few of those um, issues. So, um, I guess we're mostly handling that in the Discord um, conversation to kind of get sanity checks from people outside of the of the lab.
Yeah, we should. Um, I mean, it should be clear that the the project is is seeking to achieve a few different goals, right? One is giving us access to PBR support. Another is giving us better uh, environment maps, regardless of whether you're using PBR. And another is just to turn uh, kind of material properties into a first class entity in inventory. So, you know, it's it's an item in inventory. It makes it easy to reuse if you want to apply it to a different object sometime later. Um, so it should simplify some people's workflows as well as uh, as well as you know giving access to, to some uh, some nicer looking graphics and uh, hopefully there'll be some kind of benefits on both sides there. Um, there, there have been requests for for LSL support uh, for it, um, and and we're considering designing that, but that's further down the line, I think. Um, but the intent is that yes, in some fashion, but uh, I don't know what that means yet. <laughs> but like the idea is for this to be the the natural successor to the existing sort of texture LSL type functions, I think, uh, to to expose the the PBR functionality. Yeah, exact. That's exactly uh, my thinking on it. Right. Uh, get the core functionality working uh, with the design that we like before we add uh, scripting interfaces for it. Of course, any time you're introducing a new um... You know, content format. There's concerns about, well, what if people start using it and then you have to change something and then it breaks all the existing stuff. Um, we're going to try to. One thing we're going to, to do to try to make that less likely is that there's going to be a period of time where this is going to be, you know, available on a DD but not on Agni. So, you know, people can test it out. They can give it a, you know, run around the block and tell us about issues. But there's not going to be, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, a lot of content actually out on Agni until uh, you know we've had a chance to go through that uh, kind of refinement process and identify uh, identify some of the issues. Right, and as far as the what an LSL interface might look like, it, it's it's almost certainly not going to be able to modify the material assets themselves because. These are these are assets after all. Um, uh, the the probably the limit of what that LSL interface would look like is just being able to set the material of a face by ID. Yeah, it probably looks more or less like the way we can interact with textures with LSL now, right? You can specify a texture ID and. Uh cause something to be associated with that texture, but you can't change the texture itself. Oh, grief, HUDs. I haven't even thought about PBR and HUDs. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of cool things you could do um, by letting people set individual parameters, um, but architecturally speaking, um, you have to pick one. Can you can you modify it with a script, or can you um, transport it as an asset? And it seems like there's more value in the asset side, because uh, after all, the script could just have a set of assets that it picks from depending on what combinations it wanted to make.
And as far as trying to make sure that we build something that is going to be uh, uh, robust and portable, uh, the PBR materials themselves will almost certainly be uh, stored uh, using the GLTF 2.0 spec. Uh, so that gives us a lot of good uh, interoperability with a lot of different tools and gives us something size optimal that's an open standard um, that presumably will be extended in the future. A uh, question about GLTF mesh upload. Uh, that is on the list of things we want to do. Um, you know, if you're end up tight on time, it's possible that we would ship without that, but it's uh, it's definitely on the list of things that we're hoping to do as part of the, you know, initial project and uh, be, uh, you know, certainly likely to tackle at some point at least. And if you know content creators who want to get hands on or who have opinions and they're not already in the content features channel, um, there's a spreadsheet somewhere that I don't know where it is. Just have them drop me a line. I'll, I'll point them in the next steps. Yeah, because this is another one of those projects that runs a risk of breaking content because we're changing how some things look. Uh, we're trying to follow the rules where um, if there wasn't a seam between two faces before, there won't be a seam now. And if people really don't like how it looks, then there will be a checkbox in the viewer to turn it off. But that first one, not introducing seams where there didn't used to be seams, we really need content creators to test their stuff because there's just so many of them. It's hard to find all the edge cases, and it's the definition of an edge case.
All right. Well, maybe we've covered uh, materials, so we're open for general questions on other topics too. Anybody has stuff they want to talk about? New caps for accepting offline friend requests. Is Ryder, is that a question for you? Do you mean the caps or the problems of not receiving the uh, the friend request, Kitty? The latter? There is actually a viewer going out next week to RCs that should uh, handle that. Yep. We got a blog post ready. We just want to get it out there. Want to do some testing. It should already be on pre-flight. So check your viewers on pre-flight. Yep, yep. It is also on, uh, if you give me a few moments, I'll, I'll get a list of regions on Aditi that it's running. Thanks, Ryder. There's a, there's a list there of the regions on Aditi. Yay, thank you. If you have trouble accessing any of them, uh, ping one of us and, and we can do some juggling and get, get things on there. Beck had a question about a reverted change for mesh bounding boxes to try to accommodate uh, content that has no LODs. Um, anybody remember the history on that one? Yeah, so before the performance viewer, we just used the avatar bounding box to determine if a uh, rigged mesh was visible or not. And with the performance viewer, the rigged meshes got moved into uh, the render pipe that knows about batching and some other optimizations. Uh, and that's, but that meant that they couldn't hook into the avatar bounding box the way they used to. Um, and in particular, that was bad for uh, picking, because uh, in order to make them visible when they should be, we had to make the we had to give them a bounding sphere instead of a bounding box. Um, and it's currently an open task to go back in and give the rig detachments an accurate bounding box. Um, the behavior should be pretty close to what it was before, uh, and last I heard, Cosmic had a fix for uh, the slowdowns that were coming from ray casting. I don't know exactly where that fix is in the pipe, um, and hopefully at some point someone will be able to take a look at uh, getting those rig bounding boxes to be accurate, but that's a tricky problem. I, I kind of sympathize with the thrust of the question that about whether we really want to support LOD-less content. And of course, it would be nice if we didn't have to, but realistically, there's an awful lot of it out there. I think it would be hard to 
say you know across the board that all of the LOD lacking content is is actively maintained. I think we're get, we would get a, a whole lot of pushback about uh, uh, if we made you know life worse for folks in that situation. Yeah, I'm not aware of any change that intentionally. Um, made objects appear to be bigger for LOD purposes. Uh, there was a brief period there where um, we were using the non-rigged face LOD uh, for objects. Um, and that is something that we can't do because there's so many objects that... It's not that they don't have LODs, it's that they've applied a scale to their, uh, their rig mesh um, before wearing it, but that scale doesn't actually matter. And the viewer was looking at that scale and thinking, okay, well, that's the visual size, so I'll pick the LOD based on that. But that scale gets thrown away as soon as the uh, the animation system starts taking over. Uh, and so folks who had you know scaled um, their objects way down and then attached them were suddenly getting very, very low LODs, and the faces were actually getting removed entirely from the render pipe because the renderer thought they were too small to even bother rendering. So that got backed out, and that should be backed out. It should be based entirely on what the visual size of the object is, but that involves knowing what the size of the object is after the animation system is done with it, and that's all done on the GPU, so getting it set up with an approximation is a small project. So what did we do? Spears. It's a spear. A while back, we had a project um, where we auto-generated LEDs, and I think that's kind of on the back burner for the moment. Um, we definitely had a project where um, LEDs were being kind of auto-generated on upload, but we had other ambitions to try and do things there. Um, I mean, that we moved on to obviously materials and other things, but is there a discussion to be? In? Uh, you know. What, what to do about the fact that there aren't, we can't, cons it's like, how to, you know, improving the quality of our experience. I'm not sure if anyone wants to comment about their opinions. Uh, with existing content, there are already custom LODs defined a lot of the time. Um, and people have uploaded absolutely garbage lower LODs in order to get a lower uh, land impact. And then, you know, they tell people to set their volume LOD factor to four. Um, so that's a problem. Because when you fly around without a volume LED factor of four, lots of things are popping in and out in the background. So saying, oh yeah, you uploaded something custom. Well, we'll honor that choice. Well, sorry, people made bad choices. Um, you probably shouldn't honor them. Yep, and that's why it's tricky. Why, yeah, exactly. That's why we kind of put our hands up and said, hmm, all right, some other day. Uh, because it really does amount to understanding the intent. It's like, well, is this a good LED? Or is this not a good LED? And how do we evaluate that? It's like, well, we don't.
no no question for the people that put in the effort to make good LEDs, they're always going to be better than auto-generated LEDs. And so, um, I mean, I, I think that's the problem. I, I, I'm just throwing out that we've been thinking about it, and um, I'm sure we'll come back to it at some point as well. But um, it's something that some of us think might benefit. Um, certainly. Yeah, Coffee, I definitely want to talk to you about um, what the triangle ratios look like on your good LEDs. Um, because uh, one of the things that's been thrown out as a way to decide whether or not we're going to auto LED something is things like, um, uh, well, if you went straight from a thousand triangles to two, you're, you're probably trying to pull the wool over our eyes on the land impact. Unless it's a wall. <laughs> yeah, unless it's a building. Uh, surface area is probably a closer one. Uh, the entire surface area um, and three dimensions. So the sum of the surface area of all the triangles. Yep. Those are some nice LODs. And I can't think of an algorithm that would be like, hey, you went too low too fast. You could probably have a pretty good rule of thumb that uh, LODs with two triangles and no textures are garbage. Yeah, I kind of wonder what the count is of the creators who have behaved badly. Is it really most? Oh, goodness. Right. You definitely should not punish people who have done it right. I would say it's kind of an open question whether there's a way to 
you know, benefit content that's been done wrong without punishing content that does it right, given that there's no, you know, guaranteed programmatic way to distinguish between the two. Well, thank you very much for all that input. I, I, um, uh, someone mentioned the tough nut to crack, but um, good to hear the community uh, thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, clearly having the LODs. LODs, you know, affect the land impact is is a uh, is is a you know bad incentive in itself. Um, we we tried to fix that with Animesh, where we basically give you a certain number of triangles for free for LODs, um, and if we are able to uh, you know do a an LI update for uh, other content, then we would probably look for something along those lines. Uh, I think um, Polysale is getting at the idea of uh, trying to tell if something was a custom LOD versus a GLOD LOD by running GLOD against it and seeing if it spits out the same mesh. Um, hmm. It's a thought.
Yeah, looking at how long it takes to run G-Log, um, and how many mesh assets there are, I, I don't see us running G-Log against everything uh, that's been uploaded for all time. And I definitely don't see making viewers do it, because viewers are already... People's re uh, computers are already resource bound. Um, but bumping the mesh version and saying if we saw a mesh that's the old version, then we override the LODs. But if it's the new version, we don't. Maybe if the community can get behind that. Of course, I just said, yeah, we're not going to run LOD generation at uh, load time because the viewers bogged down, and but we're going to run LOD generation at load time. Uh. Yeah, Beck, I'm I'm kind of curious what sliver of the population would prefer, what would would care about hand tuning LODs, um, and wouldn't just use whatever's built into their content creation tool. Maybe I maybe I overestimate the quality of Blender's mesh decimator. Right, so the land impact calculation with respect to uh, streaming slash render cost um, is, when you do the math on it, what it's doing is, is trying to get the same triangle count per frame as if you built a region um, with spheres that are the same size as the mesh object and evenly distributed them across the entire uh, region um, at ground level. Um, so 
that's where the ratios come from. If if you build a mesh sphere, uh, that LODs down about the same as a SL sphere at uh, medium LOD, you should be able to get the same triangle count uh, for one-ish prims. So it's not totally made up. Yes, uh, land impact is documented on the wiki. Yeah, so the two primary motivations there were to uh, not suddenly increase the, the, the triangle count of the scene when we introduced mesh support um, versus prems. Um, and uh, another one was to try to encourage people to make good LODs. Um, it didn't really succeed.
Right. The if you look at the the way the land impact cost works out, um, that low LOD is doing a lot of uh, has a lot more weight uh, because it's visible from most of the region. Like when you see an object, almost always you're seeing the low LOD, so that one counts more. Yeah, I think the the notion of using the scale as a as an accurate proxy for for LI didn't really work out as intended. Um, I mean, if if it was really true that sort of tiny objects far away were never going to hit the render pipeline, then um, you know it would it you know the, then the idea that well if there's a lot of stuff that's far away then it's not as expensive, but I mean, first off, isn't uniformly uniformly distributed. It tends to cluster together, and secondly, people, you know, will move heaven and earth to make sure that every damn triangle gets displayed, even if it's, you know, half a pixel high. So, you know, the degree to which it's uh, loading the GPU doesn't really change nearly as much with scale as the model kind of assumes. Yeah, and we're also talking about the triangle budget for. Uh the median second life viewer uh, what and 15 years ago and of course avatars throw all that out the window which is why I had to invent a brand new LI formula for Animesh when we started having, you know, rigged content that actually had a land impact. Uh, stuff off camera is not, uh, like avatars off camera are not are, are, are not updating their imposters now. They were for a bit, um, getting rendered into shadow maps when they were impostered, but that got fixed. So coffee is your uh, bun bun bot there? Is is that supposed to be baked reflections in the diffuse map? Oh, okay. Right, uh, so we don't do LOD switches for things that are behind you, um, and we don't actually generate uh, the render batches for them until the last second. 
uh, and LOD updates get a lower priority. So you're seeing whatever its LOD was the last time you saw it. All right, looks like we're at time. Uh, thanks for coming by, everybody. A lot of good discussions this week, and we will see you next time. Thanks for everyone's feedback. Stay safe. Yeah, have a good weekend. See you on Discord.